Welcome to Out of the Fog. I'm Melissa Royal. Tonight we start with John Fitzgerald. He's a historian who's knowledgeable and passionate about the ecclesiastical district. We'll learn all about where exactly in downtown St. John's that entails and also some efforts for it to obtain a new historical designation. Then we'll hear from Kelly Sandoval and Charlotte Ackerman from Rainbow Riders. And they'll chat with us about the programming that Rainbow Riders offers and the benefits to the kids and also some new initiatives and fundraising efforts underway at Rainbow Riders. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with those guests. You're watching Rogers TV, St. John's. I want you to play. I haven't played pro hockey in about 15 years. We could take the championship, and you're gambling everybody's hopes and dreams on this wild kid. For 27 years, I dreamt of you. We need to finish it. I've seen all of us die. It consumes us from the inside. <laughs> so we don't have a choice anymore. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. I'm here with historian John Fitzgerald. Uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, you and I have uh, chatted on this show before about yes. uh, some of the historic properties and the history of, of this province, but I understand now there's a new effort underway to get a designation for the ecclesiastical district. Yeah, and that's a term that people sort of scratch their heads and say, <laughs> what the heck is that? It's a collection of 27 national historic sites and persons that are located within about a one kilometer radius in the middle of downtown St. John's. And I won't they, put you on the spot and make you name all of them, but can you no. give us the <laughs> yeah. highlights? What are yeah. some uh, So Gower Street United Church, uh, the Kirk, uh, the Anglican Cathedral, uh, the Basilica, uh, some of the convents down there. Uh, there's a bunch of cemeteries in there. Uh, Holy Heart is in there, you know, so there's, there's a whole collection and there's actually three what they call three nodes and it stretches really from the courthouse on Duckworth Street right up over the hill. I'm not rolling my eyes at you I'm trying to picture it in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so it's that's a National Historic District of Canada as designated by the government of Canada by the, the Historic Sites and Monuments Board and it's called the Ecclesiastical Precinct. But there's something new here we were we were given some encouragement uh, and this came out of the debate over building an annex at the Anglican Cathedral and also the discussion that's ongoing now about putting a condo tower behind the old Anglican so parish So some hall. more modern development in that area. Modern development in a heritage precinct and um, so we started a group called the Friends of the Ecclesiastical Precinct and we had we had a really important suggestion given to us by a gentleman who has retired to Newfoundland from Ottawa with, with his wife. He was the head of Parks Canada. His name is Jim Collinson, and he's in fact written in the newspapers. But he used to be Canada's representative on the World Heritage Inscription Committee of UNESCO. And these are the people who designate World Heritage Sites. Now, people in this province will know that we have Mistaken Point and, you know, um, Gross Morn, and we have Red Bay, we have other World Heritage Sites. Those are more sort of environmental, geographical kind of sites. Sure. Cultural and heritage sites are a different matter, especially built heritage. I was in um, Ireland and I was in Portugal in October briefly for some research and went to a palace built outside Lisbon in the 1860s and 70s. So it's much younger than yeah. some of the buildings in, our, in, in St. John's. Recent, especially for Europe. Very recent for Europe, and it's called Sintra, and it was built by Queen Victoria's sort of family, and that's UNESCO World Heritage Site, mm. right? So these things are possible, but anyway, Jim Collinson encouraged us to pursue this. This not only would be an answer to helping to preserve these buildings, but it would also bring huge amounts of international tourism attention to the heritage and sort of the center of, of St. John's. There's a lot of infrastructure here to be able to support visitors. Um, and yeah, there can be downsides to this. There can be over-tourism. There's also a need to preserve those buildings. And I, I think in light of the debate about all the, the condos and, and, and developments that we might see in downtown St. John's, there's some thought that we might keep our eyes on the bigger prize here. And the bigger prize is a process that's going to take us five, seven years to do. Um, 
and it would be an application to getting this precinct listed on the international, uh, it would have to be supported by the province, have to be supported by the city, would have to be supported by the federal government and go on Canada's list and then go to UNESCO. So you're calling this a big prize. What is the prize? I mean, what if, if you do obtain um, this distinction for the ecclesiastical district, is there money, is it attention? The money would what have to come, it? not only from the province, but it would also have to come from the federal government, and it would also come from visitors themselves, right, to, to these sites. And in the amount of money they spend there, as well as what they're spending in the economy. And it would mean that we have to, we have to take measures to preserve not only the buildings, but the precinct around them. So it's gonna take, this stuff will take a lot of work. But, but the advantage would be um, the influx of substantial numbers of, of tourists, um, the expenditure of a fair amount of, and the exposure of the province to an, a larger international audience, and the preservation of our heritage, um, which is a dynamic thing. I mean, we don't want to fix something in, in like, you know, encase it in a piece of acrylic or crystal. <laughs> we want to show people and say, look, this is, this is uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and this is an example. This particular district is an example, as some of the experts have, have, have pointed out, of, um, the only sort of collection of, if you want, Christian denomination, multi-denominational buildings in one place. You see, you go to Europe, you'll see Canterbury Cathedral or Lisbon Cathedral or, or you know, these kind of places as, or Sintra or whatever, as world heritage sites. And throughout Europe, they really have this figured out. Like, it can be <laughs> pretty modern, but they've got these designations in place because they know the value to their tourism and, and, and to their right. economy. We're not, we're not as fast as them. We haven't been as fast, but I guess there's a group of us who are saying, we really need to look at this. Right. This is a very important thing. It means we also have to get serious. I'll tell you what I'd like to see, and this is gonna be controversial, so you'll love uh -oh. it. You'll say you heard it first, <laughs> not the fuck. I would love to see this province, and I know our financial situation, and I know everything else, but <laughs> I'd love to see us with a fund, like Quebec has, to preserve its religious heritage. Gower Street is down there, a sumptuous, glorious building, Gower Street United Church, and there are bricks coming off that building. The Anglican Cathedral is trying to keep roofs and buttresses and everything else up. The Kirk is really worried as to whether they're going to be there in 10 years' time. At the Basilica, we're not doing too badly, but we, we're seeing a huge project is needed right now because there's $6 million of repairs needed on the stained glass windows, and that's a national historic site. So there's a, a fundraising effort underway, and there's an, a real effort to engage with, with visitors and, and donors and explain right. these projects. People are really interested in this stuff. And you know, I guess that the religious history to all this is reflected in the name, the Ecclesiastical District. Right. But you know, uh, St. John's is more and more multicultural. There's a lot of Absolutely. people who, who don't identify to any faith. And they're I mean, still welcome in these places. Right, so it, are, there, are there different kind of uses to some of these properties that maybe don't have yeah. religious connotations, or is this, is there a way that this district or this can be helpful to the community at large outside of the kind of religious history or the religious people? Very much so. We're seeing, for example, right now we're, we're in a season where you have groups like the Atlantic Boy Choir and Shalloway and a lot of the musical groups and acts are going into churches, into community halls, mm -hmm. going into other um, formerly church buildings and holding their, their Christmas concerts or, or uh, their performances. So. These places are, are, I mean, we just, we just did Handel's Messiah last week. Two big performances of that. So there's tens of thousands of people in our province going into these buildings on a regular basis to hear concerts and performances and choirs and musical groups. And, okay. um, and yes, they do, have a, they do have a purpose beyond sort of the religious. No one is going to, to hit you over the head going into any church in this <laughs> province and say, you must believe this. They are going to say you're welcome regardless of whatever your beliefs are, because it's a common heritage. I, I, look, at, I look at the other, uh, many of the other churches uh, outside of my own particular religious sure. creed, and I'm very proud of them. I, I, I look at the, these, these buildings and say, what an incredible thing for us to have, and we actually know that they're some of the best examples of the history and the, ar uh, the architecture in North America of these things, and we have them right here. We need to take that to the next level, and we need we need to get the province, we need to get the city behind us on that, uh, and that's that's why you'll see. I think a lot of people are. I know certainly, right. 
a lot of people concerned about the urban forest, a lot of people concerned about neighborhoods in the vicinity of, of this proposed development of, of a 10-story condo tower in front of the rooms that will block the view. But there's a, and the Anglican a, Parish Hall, right? And the Parish yeah. Hall. But there's an additional number of people who are saying, wait, like we're in the middle of an ecclesiastic, we're in the middle of a national historic district. And, you know, can, can we preserve that? Uh, the right. counter to that, though, I think is, you know, if you're saying that some of these buildings are crumbling and, you know, if, if the funds aren't there in the kind of church-based organizations, mm. um, is it not right to have some development that, I guess, can preserve them even if it does add to them? Is, is there a balance? Is there something that can be done with them, I yeah. guess, that can still preserve this history in the way you'd like to see? Most definitely, and that's called adaptive reuse. Okay. And, yeah, it doesn't mean that, that we have to rebuild the Anglican Parish Hall as it was in 1890. And, and, but what it does mean is that you are very sensitive to the architectural styles and features, and if you're going to build anything there, then you use the language, the architectural style, you use the materials, you, you take into account what was there in your new construction, and you don't build something that's so hugely out of scale that it, it, it creates problems and, and visual problems out of the style um, that, that sort of are jarring and, and are a shock to the, to the neighborhood. Right? So if people agree with you and think that, um, you know, looking into this uh, district, the, the ecclesiastical district, getting this UNESCO uh, heritage status, mm -hmm. um, is there any way they can reach out or, or add their voice? What would you suggest people do? Sure. Well, in the first case, we're watching what the city is going to do with the application to rezone the Anglican Cathedral Parish Hall. So if people have views on that, either way, I would encourage them <laughs> to express them to their city councillors and, and to the mayor and to send a copy to the city clerk of their note or their letter or their email or whatever um, so that it gets put before the council. Apparently they count numbers at City Hall as much as they count <laughs> arguments. So <laughs> it's, it's important for people to have their say. Okay. However, whichever way they, 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 they do this. But also I think it's important for us to have a, a discussion as a community about this possibility because we haven't had that discussion before. It's very clear that other cities throughout Europe and elsewhere in North America have had some of these discussions about world heritage uh, and, and the potential for, for, for doing that. And I think it would help us to preserve some of these buildings and envision a life beyond simply just the, 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 the congregations and the religious communities. And we're just about out of time, but Thanks. just quickly, I understand that there's um, an actual way some people can, oh. you're involved in that people can actually visit yeah. the Ecclesiastical District over Christmas and, uh, and see a quite a cool exhibit. So can you tell us about that? Yes, well, apart from all the concerts uh, that are on, there's um, an annual exhibit every year at the museum, which is next to the Basilica in the Bishop's Library. And it was started 15 years ago by Larry Dowie, whom, of course, everyone in the province knows. Um, of course. The, 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 cultural, the cultural godfather, if you will, of, of, of Newfoundland. <laughs> like uh, he, he was a fantastic guy, and he was a good friend. But Larry, um, Larry began this with donated, or excuse, excuse me, not donated, loaned nativity sets. And his friends, he contacted his friends, and for the weeks up leading up to Christmas, and until just a few days before, they would loan their own family nativity sets, which he'd, he'd put on display in the library. That grew from 60 sets, and now there's 140 sets. It's moved away from being a loaned exhibit now to a, to a, um, a, collection. A, a collection, a permanent collection. And there's a group of volunteers, I'm one of them, who, who help to set that up every year. Nice. But um, it's open to the public, especially on the weekends, usually... Best time is in the afternoons, but as we get closer to Christmas now, I think it's open in the afternoons and weekends until about four o'clock. So, and that's available. To and that's in the muse Basilica Museum, kind of just to the west of the Basilica. Is that's that right. Way to describe it's it? between the Basilica and the rooms. Wonderful. So, if you look for that building, you'll find it. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us and for uh, the chat. Oh, it's great really to see you again. It. Thank you. We'll be right back with more Out of the Fog. All right, girls. Uh, Mom, you said it's played again. Workplace injuries hurt the most at home. We're the generation that had it all. We're the generation that had the music and the moves. We're the generation that had a dream. We came together to feed the world's children. We came together to protect them. 
And in this dangerous world, we have to keep on saving them and protecting them, even when we're gone. If we remember UNICEF in our will, we'll be the generation who left a better world for children. Please visit uniceflegacy.ca. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. I'm here with Charlotte Ackerman and Kelly Sandoval from Rainbow Riders. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for having us. Uh, Rainbow Riders, of course, has been around for a while and a lot of good in the community and very well known. But I guess for anyone who hasn't checked in lately, um, tell us about Ra Rainbow Riders and the programs you provide. Well, Rainbow Riders has been around for about almost 30 years now. Wow. Started by a horsewoman named Andrea Gillies. So we are continuing her legacy by providing um, therapeutic riding and other un unmounted equine activities for kids that are physically, cognitively, or, um, or gosh, like developmentally handicapped. So basically therapy provides them with uh, a multitude of benefits. And what are some of these benefits that the, the kids receive through riding and other activities with horses? So some of the benefits I can speak to are related to children who might have a physical disability. So when they ride a horse, the horse movement mimics walking for them, which is something they never get to experience in their wheelchairs. Uh, helps with core strength. Um, and for children who have maybe more of a developmental, social types of challenges, um, it helps with making a connection to someone or something else outside of themselves, um, making a connection with a horse on an emotional level, um, which is really magical to see. I bet, and I bet the community that develops around that organization uh, must really be meaningful for everybody involved as well. Oh my gosh, yes. It's, uh, yeah, and we really do rely on the community to support us. Uh, we don't have any guaranteed annual funding, so we rely on fundraisers like the one that uh, Charlotte and her uh, son's hockey team are doing and uh, other um, community-based uh, initiatives to make sure that we can take care of the horses and provide you know, the training for our instructors to provide very specialized, customized programs uh, depending on what the riders' goals are. And so we've heard now a little bit of a teaser into this new initiative, the Good Deeds Cup. Um, what is this um, initiative that the hockey team has uh, undertaken with sure. Rainbow Riders? Uh, actually, it's a, a national-wide initiative available to Pee Wee hockey teams right across our country. And at our very first practice, our coach told the children uh, in the dressing room about this Good Deeds Cup, where they could give back to their community um, and an opportunity then to get national recognition for the good deed that they did for their community. So our little team decided uh, to go with Rainbow Riders. Uh, there was a connection. Um, my youngest son is the goalie for our team, and his oldest brother has been a rider for 15 years. Um, and when the team got wind of this, they are like, we want to help. We want to help mm -hmm. Sam's big brother. So um, we took on the idea of trying to raise about $2,000 to be able to give free riding at Christmas time for the children who ride at Rainbow. Um, our boys recognize they get to play hockey quite a bit um, and they wanted to kind of share their love of sport to kids who share a love of equine sport um, but what happened was amazing um, the community heard about what we were doing the boys went out knocking on doors and before we knew it the business community of st. John's Mount Pearl the whole surrounding area wrapped their arms around us <laughs> and we now have about seventeen thousand dollars raised for rainbow riders Wow. Uh, we are so excited. We couldn't be more excited. I think the giving has been meant so much to us as a little team, um, and the boys have uh, really taken this on. They're wrapping their sticks tomorrow night at their last home game with rainbow tape to support <laughs> Rainbow Riders, um, and um, the funds will be used to uh, purchase a utility vehicle for the barn uh, to help with carrying hay and water. Um, my little son, my youngest boy, equated it to their Zamboni. <laughs> so we need a Zamboni and I Rainbow right. Riders needs a utility vehicle. And so we will be are. providing the free riding as well in uh, the first few days in the new year. So a lot of our, they'll be ecstatic to oh. uh, to have some free, uh, free riding. Oh, that's amazing. We actually have some video um, of this relationship that's developed yes. between the hockey players and the riders. Um, so we'll throw to that and then we'll come back and chat about it a little bit more. Great, thanks. Stay tuned and here's a video uh, from Rainbow Riders.
Rainbow Riders it isn't any ordinary barn. It's a pretty special place. So children with all kinds of disabilities get to ride here. It could be a physical disability, it could be an intellectual disability, it may be a child who's struggling um, from an emotional perspective. So being able to ride here, it's more than horseback riding, it's therapy. So we're here today to celebrate Rainbow Riders, and in doing that, our children at Northeast Eagles hockey team have decided to um, choose Rainbow Riders for their Good Deeds Cup. So they want to give back to their community, and they want to make a difference in the lives of children who get to ride at Rainbow Riders. Most of our boys on our team get to skate maybe five times a week and some of our riders get to ride one day a week. So they want riders to be able to get to ride as much as they get to skate and to feel freedom, you know, going down the ice, all out for that goal, nothing more exhilarating. Um, and putting a child, taking a child out of their wheelchair and putting them on the horse so they can go down our arena, how exhilarating, it's freedom. You know, you get up on a horse and the horse becomes your legs and leave the wheelchair behind and wherever you want to go, you go. You know, there's no, there's no limits at all. Riding for me, it's freedom. What do you guys feel when you're out on the ice? Do you guys like hockey? Yeah. Yeah? I love riding. It's the same feeling. You can feel the wind through your helmet. Same thing. And uh, so every time I get to get on that horse. It's a wonderful feeling. And you guys, what do you guys do? You score goals? Well, I do figures. <laughs> Same thing, except a horn doesn't go <laughs> and everything. They've decided to call their Good Deeds Cup from our barn to your barn, and they want to give to this barn. Um, and they also kind of made a parallel between their arena, where they skate, and this arena, where children get to ride. So from our barn to yours, from one arena to another, let's make a difference. Well, thank you guys so much for wanting to do this. It means a lot to me. And everyone here. Rainbow Riders! Welcome back to Out of the Fog. We just saw a beautiful video from uh, Rainbow Riders about this initiative uh, that the Northeast Eagles have put forward for the Good Deeds Cup. And uh, Kelly, as Executive Director of Rainbow Riders, what does it mean to you to see these relationships that have developed and the efforts that they're undergoing to raise money for your organization? It's it's quite something to see these young people. So they're only young. I mean, they're <laughs> 10, what? 11. 11. It was quite inspiring to see how much they believe in the cause uh, and to think that they're going door to door and they have like their pitch. Uh, it's really uplifting and it's, I think also too, it's very meaningful to them to see uh, how other sports are and other abilities can be athletes. I think that's very powerful. Absolutely. And they, they saw it. They saw it right there with Nathan on the horse. And he is a very accomplished equestrian after so many years of riding. And, you know, he really gets a lot from it, but he's an athlete. And you have another initiative happening right now, and I, we have a couple of them here in front of us, the yeah. Christmas cards. Um, how did they come about? Um, you know what? We just we have sort of such talent in our pool of uh, of riders and uh, participants, and we thought, wouldn't it be nice to just get uh, get an initiative, a fundraising initiative that featured their talents? And so, lo and behold, we got quite a few submissions, and we it was hard to choose just two, but these were the uh, the the two that we went with for this uh, Christmas, and uh, they are for sale at the barn. So we encourage anyone that would like them to either phone the barn or email or pop by and uh, and visit us. They're fifteen dollars, or if you purchase ten, they're twelve fifty each. Wonderful. Yeah. And the money for from these Christmas cards, do they go towards the programming at Rainbow Riders as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, horses, as you can imagine, <laughs> do eat a lot, and they do require quite a bit of care. So we are constantly trying to. Um, 
to make sure that we have the money to be able to provide the, uh, the programming for the kids. And also, we also subsidize quite a few kids as well who wouldn't normally be able to ride. And if anybody um, you know, thinks that Rainbow Riders could have a place in their family and that they have children uh, who could benefit from mm -hmm. the activities that you do at Rainbow Riders, um, how can they get in contact or, or what kind of steps do you take to get involved? Well, it, basically, the kids that we serve are, like I said, uh, they do have physical mm -hmm. or cognitive or emotional, which is quite vast if you think about it. So it really could be as long as uh, we're, they're referred by a physician, and we have all those forms online on our w website, rainbowridersnl.com. Um, they can go there and uh, download the applications and, uh, and, and submit them. Yeah, wonderful. And as a as a mom to a rider, uh, who's now become quite accomplished in the riding, mm -hmm. as we as we've heard, um, you support the uh, the fundraising initiative and the uh, and the activities there. Absolutely, Rainbow Riders has had such a huge impact on my son's life, um, physically, emotionally, socially. Um, he says the barn is like a piece of heaven, and it's his favorite place to be. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much for joining us, and best of luck with the Christmas cards, and good luck on the uh, Good Deeds Cup. Thank you. Hope you win. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> We're right back with more Out of the Fog. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Thanks for watching Out of the Fog. Be sure to stop by the Basilica Museum to see that exhibit and also pick up some of those beautiful Christmas cards made by the Riders at Rainbow Riders. Thanks for watching Out of the Fog and we'll see you next time. Call the Rogers TV.